Everybody thought I was a joke. Do something for me. Check in on my mom. Tell her that her son wasn't a failure. No. Moonfall is a new big-budget disaster movie from the writer-director of Independence Day and 2012, where disgraced ex-astronaut Patrick Wilson heads back into space to stop the moon from falling. And much like the moon, the movie itself also fell pretty bad, because it left quite an underwhelming overall impression on audiences and ended up losing a bunch of money as a result. Meaning that Hollywood has yet another reason to avoid big blockbusters that aren't based on existing IP. Oops. And there are some individual usual aspects here to shine a light on the movie's failure. We begin with multiple time jumps, first 18 months conveniently explained by the news. Remember the accident that happened during a routine satellite repair mission 18 months ago. And then a decade explained by text, because why not? We have really weird editing where scenes just awkwardly end as if stuff was left missing. I work for the American people and you're keeping them in the dark. Yeah. And we also have terrible pretentious performances that mainly just make you cringe. I love you more than all the stars in the sky. Even more than the whole Milky Way? Way more. But individual issues like these don't really explain the full picture, because I'm pretty sure they also existed in 2012 as well, and that movie was still a massive success. In fact, Moonfall overall was constructed to be the same exact thing as 2012. There's a massive world-ending supernatural disaster, there's a very intimate human story tied to it, and this time there's even a very inherently interesting alien monster behind everything, which nowadays is a big thing as well. So then, how is it possible? How can this movie do the exact same things that made its spiritual predecessor a success plus more and still fall so so far behind. Well, you could argue that times have changed and that humanity has grown smarter, but I doubt it. No, the main blunt reason is that all those familiar proven aspects are handled really terribly. The monster aspect is just a big disappointment, the disaster aspect is mostly just non-existent and super boring, and even the intimate human side is so clearly fake that it may as well not exist. So today, let's focus on that. Let's tumble into Moonfall and see how it drops the ball on all these familiar key things that were supposed to make it a success. Here's how to fail at a big blockbuster monster disaster movie. Uh-oh. The monster movie problem here is that the monster sucks. Essentially, the movie begins with Patrick Wilson doing a repair mission in space when suddenly a malicious black mass blows past. beginning is actually great, because we have this inherently mysterious alien being that we understand just enough to perceive it as a danger driven by harmful intent. But as time goes on, the more ways the movie finds to devalue it. Firstly, for the first half of the movie, the monster is just missing. We see it once at the start and then once through a monitor at the 30 minute mark. That's it. And it's not enough. You don't have to show the monster, but the monster does need to carry a noticeable influence on scenes and obstacles and character actions and so on and so on. For example, there's a scene where NASA executive Halle Berry goes to find secret NASA footage about the monster and there's this old caretaker there, which is the perfect opportunity to use the monster. Maybe Halle Berry doesn't yet have proof about the monster's existence and needs to uncover it. Maybe the caretaker tries to stop her at all costs because he's sworn to keep the monster a government secret. As in, the monster isn't in the scene, but would still be clearly felt to be driving it. The Apollo crew played ball, everybody after. Just Brian Harper wouldn't. But of course, that doesn't happen, because all NASA people have already seen the monster, and the guy just explains the stuff for free. Mission Control cut their feed to the world because they found something on that day. Pulsating lights emanating from beneath the moon's crust. The only shot we had. Just stop it. Zulu X-ray 7. It was shut down. Like, yes, the monster does exist in the background here and everywhere else, but not directly or strongly enough. For the first half of the movie, you can barely even tell there's a monster out there. Like, for some reason, the main disgraced hero, for example, doesn't care enough to even try to prove its existence. Nope. Look, I don't want to be here any more than you do. Whereas watch something like The Quiet Place and you'll clearly see and feel the monster's impact on every scene, whether they're in them or not. 
we don't get that here until like toward the end. And so there's not much of an impact at all until toward the end. They lost a friend up there. And it was my fault. Well, maybe you should at least act like you're trying to do something about it, or like it's influencing your everyday life right now. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. No. Nope. Secondly, the monster is also diluted with all these overcomplicated arbitrary rules. Basically, when Halle Berry first sees the monster attack a recon moon crew, she somehow makes the conclusion that, oh, it's an AI that hunts electronic signals. Machines don't have intelligence. This does. It's everything we feared about AI. And it knew we were coming, so it was probably drawn out by the electronic signature of the capsule. Which is fine, because it helps us understand how to fear the monster, but then that leads to this moment later on, where Halle Berry and the others go to the moon to kill the monster with an EMP, and it just keeps getting more complicated. It's heading our way! Your phone! Casey, your phone! Turn it off! That's why I didn't go after the bomb just now. Because it needs to sense both. It's like it's programmed to seek out organic matter in an electronic environment. Exactly. Yeah, so the monster attacks technology, but only when there's humans in the proximity, and only when technology is turned on. Why? Like, now you're just needlessly making the monster seem weak, because apparently it's so uninterested slash dumb that all you have to do to survive it is turn off your phone, even if it's already attacking you. Must have been the wind. And you're also needlessly opening yourself up for confusion as well, because why is the monster attacking the core of the artificial moon if there are no people there? Why is the monster stopping its attack on the moon because of three people in a shuttle, but not because of billions of people right there coming up with ways to stop it? How is it able to specifically sense a human presence in the first place? Like, these arbitrary overcomplicated monster rules just carry harm. In a quiet place, the monsters are blind and hunt with sound, period. They hear a sound, they go attack it, even if the source has already gone quiet. It's not like they attack sound, but only when that sound is a 30-year-old human man playing Skrillex for more than 10 seconds. Keep it simple, just have the monster be able to sense electronic signals and attack when it finds them, period. Thirdly, the monster's true origin is over-explained to the point where it becomes uninteresting. Essentially, when the heroes get to the core of the artificial moon, there's this long exposition that, oh, the monster is an AI of a former human generation that turned bad. The AI suddenly became self-aware and transformed into countless swarms of nanotechnology that rose up all at once. Not only are you now using your third act for exposition, you're also taking away from the monster, because apparently it's just something created by another generation's Mark Zuckerberg, whoopie doo. Nice job, team. We don't know where the Quiet Place monsters came from, and we don't have to. If there's a really cool origin to explore, fine. But if you're just gonna say that, yeah, the monster is an AI that turned bad, which was already explored better in the 80s, it's better to just say nothing and let the audience's imagination fill in the blanks. Better to let people think your movie is interesting rather than spend time telling them that it's not. That way, maybe the monster could have held on to at least some of the value it seemed to have in the beginning. The disaster movie problem here is that not only is the disaster pretty non-existent, it's also the kind that allows the heroes to mostly just stand around, waiting around. Open the door! Oh, you gotta be kidding me. The first half of this is the fact that the disaster, for the longest time, isn't a real thing. Like, the moon is falling pretty early on, but only in the words that people say. The moon's orbit has shifted. The moon has entered an elliptical orbit. The moon is out of orbit. Really? There are no actual physical effects of the moon falling. We're not following people affected by it or doing anything about it. Apparently, entire cities are descending into chaos when the public finds out, but it doesn't concern Patrick Wilson because he's just at home fixing a car that's never driven in the movie. Apparently, the moon enthusiasts need to find a solution to fix the moon's orbit, but in practice, they're just at a hotel talking about doing something about it. Oswald did it! Damn it, Gary, not now. It feels like a disaster movie that's missing a disaster. In 2012, for example, the disaster was immediately much more present. We were with people feeling that something was off. What the hell was that? We were with people committing actions because something was off. The hero wasn't just at home, but instead at places that mattered in regards to what was happening. It's a national park. There's not supposed to be post defenses, right? I mean, 
What's going on here? Whereas a lot of the disaster stuff in Moonfall is limited to the news. Shoppers continue to stockpile supplies as mounting the mass The second half of this is that when the disaster becomes real, it still allows the heroes to just wait around in place. Like when Patrick Wilson shows up at the Moon Enthusiast meeting, that's when we get the first Moonfall consequence in form of a tide that hits a leg. But guess what Patrick Wilson has to do because of it? Nothing. He just goes upstairs with the others to sleep until the army shows up to take him to the next plot point. We need you to come with us. Okay. It's not like he needs to outrun the tide to save his son from the courthouse jail before he drowns. It's not like he needs to go to an army base to steal an EMP to destroy the monster before the base is gone. No, he gets brought to a launch site where all that stuff is brought to him for free and then it just hangs out until it's eventually time to go. Compare this to 2012 where the disaster was constantly pushing the heroes. When California starts getting eaten by the earth, we need to get out of there right now. When we arrive near the crazy guy who knows about the world's end, we need to get information from him and leave before the quote unquote fireworks begin. You know, there's this never-ending disaster created fire under the heroes. Whereas here, the moon falling for a lot of the time seems like the most chill world-ending event ever. Oh, I missed. Obviously, this gets better toward the end when the moon actually gets close enough to have an effect and when the heroes fly up to it. But the beginning is where you need to hook the audience. And you could have easily solved this issue by combining the disaster more with the monster. For example, maybe make the first act be about the hero trying to uncover the monster side of the upcoming moonfall. You know, he's grown so obsessed with the monster and what happened that that's the thing that ruined his family life. He's the one trying to figure out what's going on up on the moon. He's the guy breaking into NASA archives to find footage about the monster. And when he's finally exposed to the monster, that's when the first moonfall consequences hit. Now we gotta go save our son that we've been neglecting. Now we gotta use our monster knowledge to find a way to destroy it and convince others to join the mission. I don't know if that's a good idea, but it's better than having the hero do nothing relating to the moonfall until like the second half. It's better than immediately just saying that the moon is falling without yet being able to have it meaningfully affect our hero's journeys. Better than having one character just ramble on about alien moon for no established reason. The megastructure's power core. Excuse me, the, the megastructure? Please don't ask. It's highly likely our moon was built by aliens. I told you not to ask. Right. A disaster movie where the disaster is barely noticeable in the first 50%, that's not a disaster movie. It's a disaster of a movie. It's been nearly three hours. It can't be a good sign. The emotional problem here is that the storyline used for emotion is pretty empty and fake. Essentially, the movie creates this B-plot survival story with the children of the heroes, and a Chinese nanny because China. When the heroes fly off to the moon, we occasionally cut to the children as they try to reach safety, which is important because if there's nobody on Earth we care about, we don't care about saving the Earth. That's how you get fan It's not gonna stop! It'll create a black hole that'll swallow the Earth! We don't care. Let me tell you. The only issue here is that it doesn't work. The first half of why is that the B-plot characters are way too unestablished. Patrick Wilson and his son, they don't even interact until the son is brought to him at the 50 minute mark, and then he's already heading off into space. Bye, have a great time. Halle Berry and her son, they interact a couple times and both times it's just a few seconds of cringe. I love you. More than all the stars in the sky. Like these aren't real relationships between real people. It's more like the movie invented the children and the families out of thin air because, you know, we need something to care about down the line. The characters themselves are fine, but if you don't spend time exploring them and their connections with the heroes before we're already supposed to care about them, we're not going to care. I'm not gonna say I remember the emotional side of 2012 well, but I'm pretty sure there we cared more about even the bad guy's children because we were seeing all the things he was doing with them and for them. I have a green glass for my boss and me. If you want us to believe that the hero loves his son and would do anything for him, then don't have the hero just sleep at a hotel while his son is stuck in a courthouse jail. Have him go and try to break his son out before he drowns or something. Because if a relationship between two people is based purely on the fact that one says it's there, 
No. You fight for the people you love. Like your son. What would you give up for him? Your life for his? Absolutely. The second half of this is that the events of the B-plot feel forced and insignificant compared to the main events. For example, once the children head out, they soon get robbed by these hillbillies. Kashruka bite you. Enough of that gibberish. Which would be understandable in an end of the world situation, except the movie never even tries to offer reasons why it happens. Like why are the hillbillies robbing them? What exactly do they need their backs and Humvee for? Most importantly, in what way is the Moonfall event pushing them to do this? Well, never mind, it just happens because something needs to happen. As in, it's so forced and pointlessly unrelated to the main events that it's just annoying to pause the main events because of it. Or if it's not pointlessly unrelated, then it's way too insignificant. For example, there's this announcement that the moon is getting so close it'll suck out the mountain region air. What's atmospheric dissipation? Air is gonna be sucked away, dummy. Which on its own is great because it's a problem directly connected to the main plot. But then the heroes go get oxygen and guess what? There's nobody there. Like you're telling me that the entire mountain region is running out of air and there's no kind of chaos or mass stampede to find oxygen. It's just the same random hillbillies again. Oh, don't let us stop you. Let's go. Thank you for loading all this oxygen for us. As in, the problem is treated in such an insignificant way that, again, nobody in the audience wants to pause the main events because of it. You know, where's the stuff where the hero's dad's cruise ship gets engulfed by the sea? What the hell is this? Left, right. Oh my Left. god, bro. Right. Oh. To be fair, there are better moments as well, like when the moon gets so close it messes with gravity. It says that most of the B-plot is made up of characters we don't care about doing stuff that's either forced or tiny in comparison. Like how difficult can it be to just walk to a tunnel that's right there? Why does a little girl suddenly run out of oxygen faster than a grown man? Where's the rest of their oxygen? And how did they get left so far behind in the first place? The B-plot overall seems like an annoyance that the audience has to sit through to then once again get to the stuff they're really there for. Which I guess is the key lesson to take from Moonfall. If you can't make your monster disaster movie emotional or good, then at least know well enough to embrace that and get rid of all the boring stuff nobody wants to see. Cause it's not gonna help.